This is going to be the first notes packet dealing with applications of derivatives or applications of differentiation. We're going to be working on quite a lot of these applications. It's going to take, um, if you're in Calculus BC, probably about a month or so, and if you're in Calculus AB, probably more like two months. Uh, so we're going to be working with these blue packets for a while. It's like one of the main parts of a Calculus 1 course is now that we know what a derivative is, and now that we know how to take the derivative, even when we have product, quotient, chain, or whatever rules, uh, now, what are all the things we can do with them, right? What are the applications? This packet is going to cover two. First one, which we're going to hit with this video and probably the next video, is going to cover implicit differentiation, and then afterwards we'll get something called related rates. The implicit stuff is weird at first, but the more you practice, hopefully the better you'll get. Because uh, really all this comes down to is, is something like this. If the variables don't match, then you need to do chain rule. That's really all you need to remember for implicit. If the variables don't match, then you need to do chain rule. Let's go through and explain kind of what I mean by that. First of all, what does it mean to, to do the derivative implicitly? Well, explicitly, uh, or if we have explicitly defined functions, that means my variables are separated. So I have all the x's on one side and all the y's, typically just one of them, but all the y's on the other side, right? And that's typically what you get for every math class up until now, right? We don't typically have x's and y's mixed together. The exception would be your conic sections uh, in pre-cal, right? Uh, implicit just means I have x's and y's together in that same side of the equation. And then implicit differentiation is just taking the derivative when you have x's and y. So whenever you have multiple variables, right? Implicit differentiation means it doesn't matter what variables are in my equation, and it doesn't matter which variable you're going to take the derivative with. The thing to remember is that if the variables don't match, then you need to do chain rule. Let's get uh, this page done, and hopefully that'll kind of help lay the foundation uh, for us. Here we're going to take this equation, y cubed uh, plus y squared minus x squared equals negative 4. And we're going to take the derivative a couple of different times. First thing we're going to do is take the derivative with respect to t. Right here, it straight up tells me, take the derivative with t's, and also it says d something dt. Uh, and it says, take the derivative with w, then we'll take the derivative with x, and then just for funsies at the end, we'll also take the derivative with y. So we're going to take the derivative four times, and then, and then we'll just see what we we'll see what we can see. All right, here we go. We got x's and y's. I'm going to take the derivative with t. Remember, when the variables don't match, you're going to need to do chain rule. So let's do this first one. Here, the first term I have is uh, y cubed. The derivative of y cubed, using your power rule, is going to be 3y squared. But since that chunk was y's, and I'm doing the derivative with t, y and t don't match. So I'm going to need to do chain rule. And that chain rule means I'm going to have a dy dt. The variable that was in my term, and then divide it by the variable that you were doing the derivative with. That's kind of what this statement says. Since you're going to apply the chain rule, uh, each of these chunks is going to have a d something dt as part of the derivative. So that chunk that started with y's, since it didn't match t, you had to do chain rule dy dt, and the dy because it was a y in the chunk, and the t on the bottom, because that's what we were taking the derivative with. Okay, let's do the next one. y squared would be 2y, but y and t don't match, so I need to do chain rule dy dt. Now the next one I have a negative x squared, and I know the derivative of that would be negative 2x. x does not match t, so I'm going to need to do chain rule, and here I'm going to have dx dt. x on top because that chunk had x's, t on the bottom because that's the variable you were doing the derivative with. And then the derivative of negative 4, whether it's with t's or w or anything, the derivative of constant is always just going to be 0. So there we had x's and y's implicitly defined in that equation, and we took the derivative with t's. Just remember, when you don't, uh, when the variables don't match, you need to do chain rule. The variable that was in my term is on top. The variable you were doing the derivative with is on the bottom, right? Doesn't matter what variables there are or which one you're doing the derivative with. It only just matters whether the derivatives, uh, whether those variables match. And if they don't match, you need to do chain rule. All right, so let's do the next one. Let's go back to that same function. 
a say function. Most of the things we're going to be doing in this implicit uh, kind of topic probably will not be functions. So if you say if I say function, that's just me just speaking it because because I like to say the word function. Uh, the graph of this is going to fail the vertical line test. Okay, so it's not a function, but but we're going to still do these relations and we can still take the derivatives and we can still find the slopes of these weird graphs even though they're not functions. But here we go. We're going to take the derivative now with respect to w. So here we go. y cubed, the derivative would be 3y squared, but y and w don't match, so I need to do chain rule, times dy over dw. y on top, because that's what was in the chunk, w on the bottom, because that's what we're taking the derivative with. Remember, if the variables don't match, just do chain rule. Next one, y squared, the derivative is still 2y, but now you're going to need to do chain rule, dy dw. Then the next one is still negative 2x, but then you need to multiply it by, yep, you guessed it, dx dw. And it would still be equal to 0. The derivative of the constant is 0, whether it's with t's or whether it's with w's or whatever. All right, now we're not really ever going to do the derivative of w again. That's just to drive home the point that it really does not matter which variable you're doing the derivative with. It really only matters if it matches the variable that was already in your question. And if the variables don't match, then you do chain rule. The variable that was in my term is on top. The variable that you're doing the derivative for is on the bottom. Okay, now here's what we do typically, right? We normally take the derivative with respect to x, right? So this is what we usually always will do. So let's go for it. Same equation, uh, but now we're going to take the derivative with respect to x, and then we're going to end up solving for dy dx. All right, here we go. 3y squared. Now, y does not match x, so I'm going to need times dy dx. And then the derivative of y squared would be plus 2y times dy dx. And then uh, your derivative of negative x squared would be negative 2x. Do I need to put dx dx? No, right? dx dx, if you write it out, it's just 1. When the variables match, you do not need to do chain rule. You can put it, but then you should probably just erase this so you don't confuse yourself. You don't need to do chain rule, right? If your chunk has x's and you're doing the derivative of x's, you would not need to do chain rule for that specific piece. You need it for the other chunks, but not for the piece that had that same variable. And it's still going to be equal to 0. Okay, now we're going to do some algebra. And uh, we are going to just solve this for uh, the, the dy dx. So we're going to try to get the dy dx all on one side, all on its own. And then we'll, uh, we'll get this answer. Okay, so here I'm going to separate the derivative terms from the non-derivative terms, right? The stuff that has dy dx versus the stuff that doesn't. So I'm going to keep these two on the left. I'm going to move that over. So I have 3y squared dy dx plus 2y dy dx is going to be equal to 2x. I'm separating the derivatives, the halves, from the non-derivatives, the have-nots. And now what I need to do is factor out the dy dx. If I factor out a dy dx, you'd have a 3y squared plus a 2y left over in the parentheses. And then the last thing that you would need to do to get the dy dx by itself is just to divide by this parenthetical group, right? Divide by that chunk. So I'm going to get 2x over 3y squared plus 2y. So there we have it. There we found our derivative. Now, if your original equation has x's and y's, then your derivative is probably also going to have x's and y's, but that is okay. We can still take this derivative, we can differentiate, even when it's implicitly defined. It just means our answer is probably also going to be implicitly defined, right? So here we took the derivative with x, which is what we're typically going to do like 95% of the time. Sometimes we do t's, but most of the time we just do x. All right, now I'm going to do it one more time. I'm going to take the derivative with respect to y, just to kind of show you the relationship between a couple of nice things, right? So going back to the same original equation, I had y cubed plus y squared minus x squared equals negative 4. I'm going to take all of this, and I'm going to take the derivative with respect to y. Now here we go. Uh, y cubed would be 3y squared. I don't need dy dy. That would be 1, right? If the chunk is y's and you're doing the derivative with y's, you would not need to do chain rule. Then it would be plus uh, 2y wouldn't need dy dy. If the chunk is y's and you're doing the derivative with y, uh, you don't need to do chain rule. Minus 2x. Ooh, that chunk has x, and you're doing the derivative with y. So you'd have dx over dy. 
still be equal to 0. Let's solve it for dx dy. Right, I'm going to move that piece over, separate the haves from the have-nots. And then you'd have to divide by this 2x. And that gets you your expression for dx dy. Now, what do you notice about the relationship between dy dx and dx dy? What do you notice is the relationship between these two things? Well, they're reciprocals. Of course they are. Right? If you were to take dy dx and then do the reciprocal, you should get dx dy. So if I were to take the thing that dy dx is equivalent to and I do the reciprocal to it, you should get the thing that dx dy is equivalent to. Right, so kind of just file that in the back of your brain. If you want to like take a calc 2 or you want to take a calc 3, if you want to be an engineer or a mathematician, for whatever reason, uh, sometimes just know it may be better to take the derivative with one variable as opposed to another. It really doesn't matter. Like if you, if you know you wanted to get it to, to do y dx at the end, well, if most of your chunk is y's, you could take the derivative with y's and then get all this answer down to dx dy and then just take the reciprocal at the end, right? So it doesn't really make that much difference now for the calculus one stuff that we're doing. But if I had an equation that was like 20 terms, and if 19 of those terms were y's and only one of them was x, it would probably be easier to just do the derivative with y, because then you'd only have the one piece that has the chain rule, only one piece that has the derivative. And then once you get that derivative solved, you could just reciprocate it to get to the to the derivative that you really want at the end. Now you could still take the derivative with x, and 19 of the terms are going to have the derivative, then you have to factor out, and then it w it'll still work. But just sometimes it may be easier based on whether that equation is primarily one variable or the other. Um, yeah, there you have it. Implicit. Doesn't matter what the variables are. Doesn't matter what variable you're doing the derivative with. All that's really going to matter is do the variables match, and if they don't, you need to do chain rule, right? That's the whole idea behind implicit. And now everything else today, we're just going to practice. Okay, let's probably do a couple more, and then um, I'll have to break on this video. So find the derivative in terms of x and in terms of y. Okay, so let's go for it. Now, by the way, if you don't like writing dy dx, you could write y prime. Like, that is perfectly fine. Those are interchangeable notations. And a lot of the times, I'll use y prime because I'm lazy, right? And it's just less work to write y prime as opposed to dy dx. I'll do dy dx on the example a, but then I'm going to start doing the y primes just because I think it's a little bit faster. All right, but let us go for it. Here we go. We're going to take the derivative. Now, remember, this, this term in the denominator tells me which variable you're doing the derivative with. So I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x. All right, so let's do it. The derivative of x squared would just be 2x. Now, here you're going to have a product rule. All right, here you're going to have this product rule. You're going to take the derivative of uh, x times y. Let's do it up here at the top, uh, and then I'm not going to have to keep referencing it. Now, if I was doing product rule, right, I have the first chunk, which is x, and I have the second chunk, which is y's. When I'm doing this derivative, here's how it would shake out. You do the derivative of the first times the second. Now, I don't need a y prime here, right? I was doing the derivative of the first, and the first piece was only x's. And since you're taking the derivative of the chunk with x, and your derivative is with x, you don't need to do chain rule. dx dx is 1. But the derivative of the first times the second, I was just copying the second. Plus, now when I do the derivative of this piece, that would be 1, and then times the chain rule. Uh, so the derivative of y is your dy dx. It's 1 dy dx, or it's 1 y prime, and then times the first. So a lot of the times, how you're going to see this written out, if you have x times y and you're taking the derivative, a lot of times you'll see it as x, or sorry, as y plus x y prime. The derivative of the first times the second plus the derivative of the second, y prime and dy dx are the same, times the first. So there's your product rule written out. So here we go. Let's go copy it down. We had x times y, the derivative of the first times the second. Sorry, I'm off the screen trying to fix it. Plus the derivative of the second, which is 1 dy dx, times the first. There we go. And now I have the negative y squared. So negative 2y dy dx. And then here's a tempting mistake. A lot of times students make it, right? Uh, you get so caught up doing the derivative 
uh, in terms uh, on the left side that you kind of just forget that, hey, if I take the derivative on the left, you also need to take the derivative on the right. So it shouldn't be a 3 that it's equal to. You need to take the derivative of that 3, and you should have a 0 on the right side. Just be careful. If you take the derivative on the left, take the derivative on the other side as well. Now let's solve it for dy dx. So I'm going to separate the derivatives from the non-derivatives, right? So here we go. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, move those two over. So I have x dy dx minus 2y dy dx, I'm leaving those two on the left, but here I'm going to move those two over via subtraction. So I'd have a negative 2x minus y. Then I would have to factor out the dy dx. When you factor it out, you're going to have an x minus 2y. And then all you'd have to do now to get the dy dx all by itself is just to divide by that parenthetical group. So minus 2x minus y over x minus 2y. Okay, so that's great. Now, let me kind of show you a little trick. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to pretend like I can hear you guys answer, but it doesn't matter. Even if we were here in class in person, uh, most people probably wouldn't answer. Uh, would this be the same thing? If I were to rewrite it uh, as 2x plus y over 2y minus x, would that be equivalent uh, to that version? Well, think about what you could do, right? If I, there's really two ways. You could factor out a negative on the top and factor out a negative on the bottom. And then those two negatives, the one on the top and the one on the bottom, if you factor them both out, they're going to cancel. Or you could think about multiplying by a negative one on the top or multiplying by a negative one on the bottom. If you multiply that negative one and then distribute, multiply the negative one and then distribute. As long as you change all of the signs, it will indeed give you an equivalent version of the answer, right? So change all the signs. Notice this one was predominantly negative. Three of the four terms were negative. So to get the equivalent expression, those three terms would now have to be positive, And then the term that was positive changes, right? It's like multiplying it all, the top and the bottom, all by negative one. Or you could think about factoring out the negatives on each layer and then reducing. But those two are equivalent. And most of the time, when you're working on the AP exam, most of the time, these multiple choice questions the majority of it is going to be positive. So if you're working on a question and you get something like that for an answer, and if that is not one of your four answer choices, that doesn't necessarily mean that that answer is wrong. It just means that the answer is in a different form. So algebraically, I just have to recognize, hey, what would maybe be equivalent to it? And the AP exam prefers when the answers are mostly positive, right? That's just their own personal preference. And also another little thing, like here, this order in the addition, uh, you could have rewritten this as x uh, or as y plus 2x. And then now notice, right, you, it's addition. So of course you could flip the order, but now you have the y's vertically aligned and you have the x's vertically aligned. A lot of the times, I know it's trivial, but a lot of the times the answers for the AP exam will kind of look as nice as possible, where the majority is positive, And if there are any like terms, they would try to vertically align them if at all possible. Now, if you want, you could have just gotten straight to this answer, right? Remember how I got to this was I actually kept the derivative terms on the left, moved the non-derivatives over. Remember, when I moved these over, they became negative. I had to subtract them over to the other side. You could have just done it differently, right? So this was one route that got you to this uh, answer. If you would have just separated them differently, like, hey, if I would have just left the 2x plus y on the left, and then if I would have taken those two terms and moved them over to the right, let's see what would have happened. This term, you would add it over, so it become a 2y dy dx. And then that term, you would need to subtract it, so you have minus x dy dx. Then you'd have to factor out the dy dx, 2y minus x. And then look, right here, you're still going to end up with this same thing. So really, whether you end with the primarily negative or whether you end with the primarily positive, that's only going to be dictated based on how you separated the derivative terms from the non-derivative terms, right? Uh, so again, they're both equivalent. The AP exam kind of prefers the mostly positive answer. And if you can vertically align it, a lot of the times they will also try to do that. But there's multiple correct ways to write these answers. And a lot of the times you're going to get one and it may not 
look exactly like my answer key, or it may not look exactly like one of the four answers on the AP exam, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means you may have to do a little bit of algebra at the end to confirm, hopefully, that you have an equivalent answer. All right, cool beans. That took up a lot of space, so I'm going to do a little bit less uh, for the example B. Here we go. Tangent of x equals 3x plus x times sine of y. So again, I'm going to need to do product rule for this piece. But let's go take this derivative with respect to x. The derivative of tangent is secant squared. Since your term was x's and you were doing the derivative of x's, you don't need to do chain rule. The derivative of 3x is just 3. And now for this, you're going to need to do product rule. The derivative of the first is 1 times the second and then plus the derivative of the second would be cosine y, y prime, or cosine y dy dx, times the first. So I said I was going to do y primes, and then I lied. I'll do y primes in the next one. So I had the derivative of tangent, then I had the derivative of the 3x, and then this needed product rule. So I had the derivative of the first times the second, which I just copied. Then I did the derivative of the second, and when I do the derivative of the piece with the y's, that's when you need the y prime, or that's when you need the dy dx. You don't need it here, because you were just copying the second. Uh, and then I had the derivative of that second times the first. All right now let's isolate, let's solve for this dy dx. So here I'm just going to take this, move it over, take this, move it over, take this, move it over. So I've got secant squared x. Uh, how about minus sine of y minus x? Uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, let's see. I can't subtract the x, right? Because that's attached. Uh, so that's just a minus 3 equals x cosine y dy dx. I am running out of room on this paper. Sorry. So I took this, moved it over, took this, moved it over, all that's one chunk, and then I would just have to divide by all this stuff, right? All that's going to go to the denominator. So I'm going to end up with secant squared x minus sine of y minus 3 over x cosine y equals dy dx. Okay, so there's a pretty good answer. Again, you could really flip the order for those. Like you could do minus 3 minus sine of y. doesn't matter. Those are equivalent answers. All right, next one. Uh, and I'm going to do this one with just the y primes. So that way uh, you can see both notations. Okay, here we go. I've got cosine of x times sine of y. You're going to need to do product rule again. So let's do it. I have this first chunk. And then I have the second chunk. So let's think about our product rule. The derivative of the first would be negative sine. And since that chunk is x and you're doing the derivative x, you don't need to do chain rule. The derivative of cos x is negative sine x. So the derivative of the first times the second. I just copy. Don't need a y prime or don't need a dy dx because I wasn't doing the derivative of that yet. I did the derivative of the first times the second, so I just copied. Plus, now I'm going to do the derivative of the second. And the derivative of sine of y is going to be cosine y times, you could either put dy dx, where I'm going to do y prime. So I had the derivative of the first times the second, plus here's all the derivative of the second. Don't forget to multiply it by the first. It's all going to be equal to 0 because the derivative of root 3 over 4 is 0. Now let's solve it for y prime. Again, y prime is the same thing as dy dx. You use whatever notation you want. I will usually use the prime notation because I'm lazy and it's less writing. All right, so I'm going to take this chunk and add it over. I have cosine x, cosine y, y prime. Right? I just kind of rewrit this. I just brought this out to the front. That's all the stuff that I'm leaving on the left. Take this, add it over. So I have sine of x, sine of y. I moved it over. Then I would have to divide by cosine x, and I'd have to divide by cosine y. That will get rid of all that stuff. So I have this expression for y prime. That's really good. Let's think. Would this be the same thing as tan x times tangent y? Well, I already gave it away because I boxed it. Yes, those are the same things. You could group it. Sine x over cosine x, that's tangent x. And then sine y over cosine y, yes, that's your tangent y. Now, if you had something like this, you could not call it a tangent of anything. Or if you had something like this, you could not combine the trigs, right? If you have trig with the same argument, then yes, sine over cosine reduces to a tangent. But you can't combine trig that has different arguments. But you could write this answer as tan x times tan y. And again, you could have that as y prime or 
uh, DYDX. I'm going to actually stop this video for now because I have a meeting to go to. I will pick up with the next example in the next video.